Hornby have captured that look, shape and feel of the 56 quite well. And for those of you who have been wanting a BR Small Logo Blue Class 56, you have finally had your calls answered. A big hello to you! Welcome back to the channel, it's so great to see you, I hope I find you well. I'm Jennifer Kirk, welcoming you back here to the loft on Weir Yard. And today we're going to be taking a look at a new release of an old favourite. It's the Class 56 model from Hornby. And this is a model that, uh, I must admit, it was announced some time ago. But it just appeared in the shops and there was no real announcement that it was going to be here shortly. It just happened. And I don't know about you, but I actually really do quite like it when models just unexpectedly are there. It's something really nice to go into a local model shop and just find a model that you'd forgotten about maybe. Just turn up on the shelves and be there to buy. And that is exactly what's happened with this model. And Hornby have very, very kindly sent over a review sample so that we can take a really good close look at here on the channel. And we're gonna do just that. So come with me in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Find the full range available to order now at tramfabrique.co.uk. Additional support comes from Rails of Sheffield. Sell to the name you know and trust. Buy, sell or exchange any age or any gauge. Rails will take everything, locos, coaches, wagons, track work. They will take absolutely everything and certainly will not cherry pick the best items. Call them now for the very best price and get instant cash payment or same day transfer. Check them out today at the link below. So I'm really, really excited about this because I must admit that the Class 56 is a type of locomotive that I've long felt that my collection was lacking and it was just simply a case that the uh, earlier liveries from Hornby just weren't out there. They were going through some of the later privatisation liveries and waiting patiently does sometimes pay off. So a big, big thank you to Hornby for sending over one of the new release of the Class 56s and let's take a good close look at it. The Class 56 from Hornby has made a welcome addition to the range, and unlike a lot of mother models that we've been talking about on this channel, it's turned up with no fanfare, no ticker tape parade. Uh, in fact, the first that I knew that this model was available was that Hornby very kindly sent over this particular model uh, as a review sample so that you guys can get a good close look at it. And I must admit that um, I quite like it like that. I've checked around and they are on the shelves in an awful lot of shops, so pretty easy to get hold of now. But I like models that just turn up and just slide on in onto the shelves of the model shop without any fuss whatsoever. I know some people do like the idea of having plenty of time to save up, but actually I'm not one of those people. So kudos to you Hornby, I like that. The model that they've sent over is 56047 in this small logo rail blue and that's indicative of the class when they were first introduced in the mid 1970s and how they ran right through into the 1980s when the start of sectorization appeared and the locomotives were slowly repainted into those sectorization liveries and then when privatization came along the whole fleet passed through to EWS. Now, by rights, they should have kept going and been quite a, a long running locomotive, and probably only about now would EWS have been looking to uh, replace the fleet as a whole. But instead, EWS took a very different route, and instead of persevering with the locomotives that they inherited en masse, they looked to North American locomotive builders uh, to build a very large fleet of Class 66s for super reliability, and that displaced a lot of these locomotives and a lot of other 
British built locomotives such as the Class 58, the Class 60, as well as legacy locomotives like the Classes 47, 73 and 86, which uh, meant that a lot of these ended up pretty much facing scrap quite early on. A number were sent overseas where they were hired out to operators there and a few have managed to make it to the hands of other smaller operators in recent years so they can still now be found running on the main line uh, despite the fact that um, they very rarely looked at uh, a not very rosy future as the class 66s rolled on in. The model that Hornby have sent over is R30073 and you'll see it comes with a 21 pin connection and I'll talk a little bit more about that during the course of the review. We will also be doing a full DCC fitting guide and for that I will be using the 21 pin decoder from Train-O-Matic which are available here in the UK through their UK stockist Tram Fabrique. And if you're here for the DCC fitting guide, then you'll find that in the final third of this review. On the back of the box, again, this is something that Hornby do really well, and I do like it. And it's a small potted history of the class of locomotives with some specifics at the end, which um, show you what happened to this particular example. Introduced in 1976 because of increased requirements for heavy freight haulage, the contract to build these was awarded to Brush Traction in Loughborough, but they then subcontracted to Electroputer in Romania due to the lack of capacity that they had, and the initial 30 locomotives were built in Romania, but did suffer from transit damage and construction deficiencies, and actually had to be extensively rebuilt. And because of this, the um, rest of the 105 locomotives were built in the UK, uh, mixed between Doncaster and Crew Works of British Rail Engineering Limited. Nicknamed as Gridirons or Grids, they did displace Class 20 and 47 locomotives, although those locomotives did find themselves cascaded into other flows on the railway. These in turn displaced, as we said before, by the Class 66s. They were placed into storage between 98 and 2004. And uh, for a good long time, you could see huge lines of Demic locomotives, including 56s, just dumped at a number of rail yards. Three locomotives have thus far been preserved, 56006, 56097 and 56301. And there are still a small number which are still in everyday freight use with a number of smaller freight operators. This particular locomotive, 56047, was outshopped from British Rail Engineering Limited's Doncaster Works in July 1978 and was withdrawn from service in March 1999 and was later scrapped at Immingham in December 2003. Now the box itself features the slip case with a photograph of the model. I do actually think that this is a great way of showing off the model without you actually ending up with this, which is trying to peer at a model through a lot of plastic, which does distort the look. Everything else about this box is pretty standard. We do have that decoder addendum, if you hadn't spotted on the box beforehand, and this just gives the update for the DCC socket. Now, I suspect that Hornby are actually using the 21 pin circuit board that they produce specially for the sound fitted versions which were put out quite a long time ago now before the TTS range was introduced and this was uh, necessitated because the sound decoders were bought in from ESU and a, a number of different models from across the range had special 21 pin versions released purely for the sound fitted options and now that Hornby has decided to uh, upgrade its entire range to the much much more versatile 21 pin decoder interface from that 8 pin decoder interface it does mean that I suspect a number of different locomotives will very quickly have that 21 pin version resurrected. What's really good in here is we get a note of where the additional detailing parts that are in a little bag in the packaging, which I'll show you in a moment, 
where they actually go on the buffer beam. But these are a little bit of an either or with the coupling there, which fits into an end pocket. If you fit the coupling, you can't fit the detail and vice versa. We've also got the information on how to get inside the model and the legacy bit here with the eight pin decoder. Ignore that, that has been superseded. Sliding the model out from the slip case, there is the extra detail parts that I talked to you about. We've got the two couplings and the front buffer beam pipe work and such like. There is enough there to do both ends, but if you do do that, then uh, you will need to find some other means for the locomotive to couple up to anything. The first impression of the locomotive is that it is very heavy. It's actually surprisingly heavy here. I can feel that there is a lot of weight to the chassis and that in turn does mean that that's going to give it a lot of traction and grip when running on the layout. And we will be putting it through its paces later on. First impressions are good. It really does capture the shape of the Class 56, which does look like a kind of 47 on steroids. The bogey sides though are a little bit on the flat side and this is probably a legacy of the fact that this model was tooled up in 2007. They do have the detail, but as you can see there, they're clipped well on to the outside with the wheels just hidden away inside there. Although what we do have is brake blocks that line up with the wheels, although they are quite a way back. This does mean that any modeler that wishes to convert this to EM or P4, there is plenty of space in there to accommodate the wider wheel sets. And it also means that from the side, there is that optical illusion, which means that this locomotive does look more like the wider prototype than what we get with double O track. Double O track being a couple of millimeters too narrow to represent the UK 448 and a half rail lines. The front face of the locomotive has been captured really well and everything that you see on here is factory fitted. The glazing is nicely flush and we don't have too much of that fishbowl effect around the edges. I particularly like these windscreen wipers, which are parked on their respective windows in different positions. And this is something that you would tend to see with the prototypes because each of the windscreen wipers were operated from completely separate linkages and motors, unlike what you'd find on a car. I do like all of this, this grill that's on here. I'm just looking very, very closely. That is really finely printed. It looks like it could be an etched part, but I don't think it is. In fact, looking very, very closely at it, that is printed on there. I'm really impressed with that. For me, that is something that just shows that with careful printing, you can give the impression of a grill with space behind it without actually having to go to all of the effort of modeling it. That is actually really well done. We've got these jumpers fitted in the stowed position and their corresponding port here that they would plug into when you plugged the locomotive into whatever they plug into. I'm not actually entirely sure whether they would be multiple working cables or electric train heat. And I'm sure somebody in the comments would put us all right and let us know which it is, or indeed if it's something completely different. We do have quite a complement of lights on the end. You can see that the model is correctly kitted out with a set of tail lights, marker lights, and there's also a central high intensity headlight too. I also like the sharpness of these overhead warning flashes. Again, really, really nice. And all of these uh, grab handles, these are all separately applied, finished in white. They feel like they're made of plastic, but it is quite a strong, resilient plastic. And it doesn't feel like they're in any danger of breaking, which is really good to see. Cab side windows also feature that very, very slender bar in the glazing. I think, feeling there, that is printed onto the glazing. Again, really effective. It does work so, so well. 
Looking here between the yellow and the blue, there is a little bit of a bleed over where the different colours have been sprayed on. It's not 100% sharp between the two, but from most viewing distances, it's not too bad. And to be honest, the only reason that we're noticing it now is because we're looking at this magnified to what is actually several times the actual size the model is. The cab doors on these are one of the features that uh, were introduced in 2007 to the model along with the Class 31 and the Class 08 shunter and they're spring loaded. All four of the cab doors can be pushed open and uh, it's a great opportunity to either you could disable the spring, glue the door slightly open and that is something that they would particularly in hot weather sometimes run with cab doors open for ventilation or maybe here's an idea a driver figure propped in that doorway looking out and that is another option to really customize and make your locomotive unique to you and your layout again we've got further printing here for this checker plate it works really well it's even got a texture to it and that's something that you can do with this printing the paint itself makes up the scale thickness of the design and does give you that hint of texture. Looking at it, I'm not entirely sure. It may even be that part of that is included in the mold, but certainly again, like that grill we saw on the front, that is really, really well done. The metal handrails for the cab, well, they are correctly fitted. And uh, as per the prototype, one long, one short, We've also got the characteristic double door handle on these. One at the top for when you're stood on a platform, like a station platform, so you've got a door handle at the proper height. And then one down here for when you're stood at track level to climb into the locomotive. There's another overhead warning flash there. Again, that is really, really sharp. And actually the demarcation on the yellow and blue on the door is much much sharper. These body side grills are a particularly nice touch. As you can see there, you can just about see behind, you can see through the engine compartment. These are etched, I believe brass, fitted in there and there's also some ribs behind made out of plastic to give the proper look of the prototype. I can also see a suggestion of bulk of equipment in there and when we look inside, we'll take a look and see just what that is and how well it works together. We've actually got this bulk here of the fan mechanism. And that's actually pretty good. With the gaps underneath, it gives a sense that we've got something big inside the body, which I think is pretty prototypically accurate. We've got more grills here at the top. Again, we've got them as the uh, metal grill over the top of a kind of plastic inlay to give a real sense of depth. Looking further round to the top, we've got the correct roof profile there. The uh, rivets on the panels, particularly fine and nice. The top of the cab roof is really, really well done. It's a characteristic shape and you can see it's not a plain radius. The curve is a compound curve in multiple directions, actually something that's really hard to do in model form, but Hornby have captured that look, shape and feel of the 56 quite well. These roof fans are separately fitted down inside the body of the locomotive. Again, we've got that metal mesh over the top, which uh, really does set them off. In earlier releases of the 56, these fans would actually spin round and the model had this kind of rubber band belt drive that meant that when it was moving, these fans would spin. On this model though, that has been removed. There's still a groove for the rubber band in the brass flywheel down there, but the rest of the mechanism that attaches back to these has been removed. And while some people might say that that's a retrograde step, I don't agree. I never liked them. I actually disabled it on my Hornby Class 31 because I felt it looked a little bit odd. They were matched to the speed of the locomotive rather than anything else and I just felt that it drew attention to the lack of realism. It was also the case that the rubber belt drive 
could have a habit of squealing like a stuck pig after a few years, and indeed the rubber belt could also stretch and snag and just generally cause a little bit of a nightmare of uh, maintenance. So I'm actually quite glad that they've removed that mechanism. If it also helps try and keep the costs down too, I don't see it as a problem at all. The side louves are uh, just molded on, but really quite nicely done. We've got all of the detail of how these fit together. And then we've got the exhaust ports on the roof. It's a shame though that you can see that these are just blank indentations, whereas some of these other vents are separately fitted parts. Really, really nicely done. And just to avoid any kind of bleed through, there's actually some black tape underneath just to make sure that you just see black, a kind of inky black with a sense that there's just nothing that you can see underneath, just like the prototype. And that's a really nice touch. Moving further down, these roof panels are perfect. And as we move further back, they follow the correct pattern of the Class 56 until again, we get that quite complex skinhead look at the other end. The finish of the blue is particularly pleasing. And again, it's another area that Hornby have got really right. This rendition of rail blue has this kind of satin look to it. There's the perfect base for additional weathering, but does look quite pleasing when it's squeaky clean out of the box like this is here. The double arrow logo is pretty sharp. And if we look back to here, the 56047 is crisp and sharp, as is the TOPS data panel underneath. I'm struggling to read that with my naked eye, even with the magnification from the camera looking on the viewfinder, but I've got every faith that that will be quite clear when we see it under extreme magnification. Looking back to those bogey sides though, you can see that there is plenty of detail on there, but it's all modelled within quite a tight two-dimensional frame, which is a little bit of a shame. And the wheels themselves do have quite a chunky tyre on them, which is quite visible. And I think that that is something that maybe even a quick coat of black paint, matte black paint, would go some way just to remove that look of these quite chunky tyres. The rest of the fuel tanks and other body side details is nicely done, although there is no additional printing on this just to pick out some of the detail. This is an area that some careful application of some humbrol enamels just to pick out little bits of pipework and maybe just dry brush over some of the raised detail would really bring this alive. And maybe that's an area that Hornby might consider in the future just to bring a little bit more something extra to this model. We've got sanding pipes, which are made from a kind of springy plastic. I was worried that these might catch on things, but actually they've done quite well. And then looking back to the buffer beam, we've got spring loaded metal turned head buffers. That one's just a little bit tight in there. And it quickly does free off. And they are quite slender, quite nicely done. And uh, then we've also got this kinematic self-centering NEM pocket, which if you don't use these for uh, attaching couplings, you can just remove them. And it does mean that on tighter curves, the model does have a more close coupling, but doesn't run the risk of buffer lock. Looking inside the cab, there is a suggestion that there's a rear bulkhead in there, and I can see some detail. In fact, I think I can see a couple of chairs, but it's a little bit difficult just to pick that out. There isn't any cab lighting on these models, and even if we push the door open, it's actually quite difficult to see what is in there. And when we get the body off, it's one of the things I do want to take a look at and see just what this model has in terms of cab interior. So you can see there, there's a lot of separate printing and detail on it. And it feels to me that this model should have had cab lighting to show that off. We've even got a fire extinguisher down at the bottom. All of this uh, cable work is picked out and it really does look good. And as you saw from the outside, just so difficult, if not impossible, to see what's in there. Looking back 
into the cabs, you can see that we do have a full desk and a couple of chairs. The desk inside does look like it's got an element of decoration as well. Again, such a shame that Hornby haven't added cab lights. I think that they would do a great job, if only to highlight just what you've got in this model. You can also see that spring-loaded mechanism there. And if you want the door to be open and not force itself shut, just remove that spring and then you can pose the door whichever way you want. Running on the DCC Concepts Rolling Road on my DC test track, the model was a little bit hesitant at first, but once I got it running, I was able to leave it running for around an hour in each direction. And even though there was a slight tight spot on the motor, that did ease with time and some running in. I'm gonna put that down to being a one-off, possibly one that perhaps slipped out on a Friday afternoon. It's not insurmountable and the model does still run, but it's not something that I would expect that you would find on your model. When it comes to DCC fitting, we're gonna be using the 21 pin Trainomatic decoder sourced through Tramfabrique, their UK stockist, with details at the URL in the description down below. Tools for this though are a little bit different from what we'd normally have. First up, is a smaller flathead jeweler's screwdriver. And this is because the model features four screws held in place with a flathead rather than crosshead. These can be found just by pushing the bogey to one side, just down there. It's a little bit difficult to see on camera. And then back the screw off. And with this, it's usually as well to try and get that screw out, each one in turn, just so it doesn't lock the bogey up. Move the bogey to one side there, and I find going down between the wheel and the bogey side frame is easier. If you try and push the bogey the other way, you don't quite get enough room. Again, just shake the uh, bolt free, and then we've got two more at this end of the model. And then inverting the model, Place the locomotive down on a safe, flat surface and then lift the body clear. Don't just pull it straight off because as you'll see, it's still connected at either end by the cable that enables the directional lighting. These can be unplugged. Looking now to the internals of the model, we've got a central motor with a big brass flywheel at either end and then carden shafts that drive to the bogey towers at either end, giving us all-wheel pickup and all-wheel drive. The 21-pin decoder blank sits here. And for this, I'm going to choose the largest of the flathead screwdrivers, just to carefully prise this up. First one side, then the other, and just ease it slowly. With the 21 pin socket, you don't want to just pull it off from one side because what will happen is you'll bend all these pins. At best, you'll then end up with these being quite difficult to line up on the decoder. And at worst, you'll damage these pin headers such that you cannot fit a decoder at all. Discard the blanking plate and then we're going to put in that 21 pin decoder. With this, Look for the locating pin. It has a corresponding missing pin on the header. Line it up. And no pressure is needed to get it to just, you can feel it drop down. If it's not dropping down, if it feels like there is resistance, then you've basically got it lined up wrong. Don't force it. And then carefully just rock it and push it. And that is now firmly in position. By default, out of the packet, that will be address three. And we can send the locomotive on to the programming track to program it as any number that you need to match in with your fleet. One other potential little project for you is to add directional cab lights. These decoders have six auxiliary functions, of which you're only using two for the directional lights. There are another two full power outputs, 
which can be used to drive small LEDs and be switchable from your control panel. It's quite easy to wire these direct to a small LED just above here in the roof of each of the cabs and that would be a great little project to give you switchable cab lights. Once we're happy that we've got this in place, make sure that you get the body of the locomotive the right way round, matching these grill holes up with the fans on the chassis, and then carefully plug back in the headers for the directional lights. Once those headers are on, just another quick visual check, making sure we've not got any wires caught over these holes for the body retaining screws. Let's just slide this back down on top. Turn the model over, drop into place, then each of these four, just find the hole. And then with your small cross head, gently tighten until you start to feel resistance and stop. They don't need to be gung-ho, otherwise what you're more likely to do is strip the collar out of the body, and then you'll find that you can't tighten it up at all, and the screw remains loose. And there we have it, all fitted and done. Now is also a great opportunity to fit the couplings. Opening up the detail bag, with this model, I'm going to fit the coupling to both ends, and that just gives me more operational flexibility for the locomotive. Make sure that you've got these the right way up. Support the actual NEM pocket. Feed the tails in, and then push until it clicks. And there we have couplings fitted to both ends of the locomotive. The couplings themselves are perfectly heighted, so that they are a perfect match up to any other item of rolling stock. And there's no signs of visible coupling droop at all, which is really good to see. I am aware that the model did have a bit of a tight spot. The more the model ran, the smoother it seemed to get. And actually I'm quite confident that this model with a little bit more running would start to iron out that little bit of juddering at low speed. And I put that down to that slight tight spot with the motor, which I suspect is unique to this model and not indicative of the full production batch. So we turn now to the scores. First up is build quality. And the model is pretty well put together. It's easy to get apart, and none of the detail parts are prone to falling off. We do get an awful lot of detail factory fitted on the front and rear of this model, including those windscreen wipers and the jumper cables. All of the handrails were well attached and in no danger of coming apart, and the underbody detail too did feel pretty robust. The only area I could really fault the build is that there was a tight spot on the motor and even though that got better with a lot of running it was still there and still a little bit noticeable so I'm going to give this a 9.0. On running quality the model ran at medium to high speeds really really well and was actually quite smooth despite the tight spot that I detected when first getting the model onto the track. It ran with quite a long rake of Mark I coaches, up and down gradients and through a lot of complex point work on the layout, including double slips, reverse curves and facing and trailing points. There was no hint of instability, no sign that it was struggling at all with any of the rails or check rails and it really did feel a sure-footed model. All of the weight in the ballast inside the chassis of this locomotive did make sure that it was uh, really quite capable of hauling prototypically long loads. And I can imagine this paired with a huge rake of the HAA hoppers, it would really look the part that it was prototypically built to haul. The area where it did struggle somewhat was the slow speed starts. 
Here, there was a sense that the model was juddering just a little bit with the standard CV settings of the decoder. And this is something that I'm sure with some fiddling of the CVs, I could probably get that to go away. But as a benchmark, I try and run the locomotives without having to change any of the CVs so that I get a more direct comparison. So overall, I'm going to give this a 7.8 out of 10. On DCC fitting and innovation, the model has now gained that 21 pin socket and it does go to bring it forward to a point where it's a lot easier to DCC fit because the 21 pin decoders fit within a clearly defined footprint and are really quite easy to get in and out and there's no mistake of putting them in accidentally the wrong way round. It also future-proofs the model, allowing Hornby at a later date to add in a number of extra features, although none of those were present here. And it really did feel that whilst we do have directional lighting, and that was pretty good and very, very sharp, there was a missed opportunity to also include cab lighting. And when you looked inside the model, there was a lot of evidence that a lot of effort has gone into detailing and finishing that cab back bulkhead. And it's a shame that you can't really see that all that well. And this is an area that cab lighting really would bring the model alive. And it feels like Hornby have missed a trick with this. Although I'm sure with later releases, that is one area that they will seek to improve the model. Overall, it's nice to see that Hornby are starting to upgrade the chassis to bring them more into line with other manufacturers and the way that standards have moved. And it'll be great to see just what they do with the added benefits of the 21 pin decoder socket that will allow an awful lot of extra features, not just lighting, but also perhaps otherwise on sound fitted models. And I'm going to give this an 8.0. On accuracy and quality of finish, one of the things that was a little bit in the back of my mind is that these bogey sides are just a little bit flat. Whilst we do have brake blocks that line up with the wheels, there's quite a space left in between. And this is accentuated a little bit by these quite shiny, thick tyres that the wheels have. The bogey sides, I'm sure, would really start to improve with a little bit of weathering, some dry brushing perhaps, highlighting and low lighting that detail will really make it look something special. But that's not how it comes from the factory. The rest of the underbody detail, again, suffers a little bit from just being in the base colour. A lot of this little bits of pipe work could be benefited again from being picked out in different colours. And that's something that I've seen on other models really make them look something special. And when all that effort has gone into decorating the bulkheads in the cabs, it's just a shame that it hasn't been done on more noticeable areas, such as these external fuel tanks with all of its piping. It's an area that Hornby could have got a lot more value for that decoration. And certainly it does seem a little bit of a missed opportunity. The model itself is representative of one particular build type of the Class 56. The real locomotives had quite a few different detail differences, and it's a shame in a way that the model can't represent more of the different types. So you do get a slightly more generic body shell with this model. So I'm gonna give this an 8.0. On value for money, the RRP is around 217 pounds, and that is quite expensive for a model that's been in the range for quite a good few years. But the model is in some ways just a little bit of a victim of how circumstance have moved on. When it was first tooled up, this really was cutting edge. And the cab doors that open with the spring-loaded mechanism to make them shut again really was something that made this model special at the time. But over the years, the problem is that models have moved on, and what seemed like a really great idea back then is something that may well be adding quite a bit in terms of the production costs for this model. And that's something that I suppose they've got to get to grips with. My thoughts would be that perhaps these opening doors are a step just a little bit too far in this more expensive time. And it's something that maybe if the doors were just glued in place, 
rather than with all of that mechanism to make them spring-loaded, might actually be quite acceptable to the modeler, and in turn, just cut down a little bit on those tricky assembly costs. What I do like, though, is that we've got really, really great use of the printing to make this at the front look like a grill over a recess that goes back into the bottom of the cab. The printing even makes that upright there look like it's behind a mesh grill, and I just really like that effect, and for me, it's one of the great high points of this model. Discounted, I'm still finding these at under the £200 mark, and there's a lot of different retailers out there that you can find them with the greatest of ease. They are plentiful on the market, and for those of you who have been wanting a BR Small Logo Blue Class 56 for quite some time and been waiting patiently through the more modern liveries from Hornby, you have finally had your calls answered. Overall, I did feel that the price was a little bit expensive for an old model, but probably for a lot of the reasons that I've said. I'm going to give this 7.1 on value for money. And that gives us an overall score of 39.9. It's still pretty respectable given the age of the model, but there are a few areas where there is still room for improvement. And I would be really looking forward to see if Hornby would take on things like that cab lighting. It's a small thing which they can now do with that 21 pin interface. And the decoration is already there inside the cab. We've got fully picked out consoles. We've got seats, we've got that really quite nicely detailed bulkhead with its fire extinguisher and the conduits all picked out in different colours. And cab lighting is something that would very easily show that off, make a big feature of it. And I think that that's something that the future could well bring. It's still a respectable model for its age and it's still got a place to play in the fleets of so many modellers model railways. Well, I hope you really enjoyed today's video and found it informative. And I'd love to hear from you in the comments about what you think about this model. It's a really great way of sharing your thoughts with other modelers and creating a resource here on YouTube that people can come and take a good look at and get an honest, unbiased opinion of a model before they purchase one. And uh, is this a model perhaps maybe that you've already got and bought? What are your experiences of it? Or is this something that maybe you just spotted something in the review that you think I missed and maybe think it's really important to share that with other modelers? Leave your comments down below. Don't forget as well that you can head on over to Patreon and help to support the channel to make the videos that you want to see in the future. We've got a number of different of tiers of rewards and there's something there for everybody's pocket. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying please like, share and subscribe. And until next time, take care, happy modelling, bye for now. Today's video comes in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCT decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Find the full range available to order now at tramfabrique.co.uk. Additional support comes from Rails of Sheffield. Sell to the name you know and trust. Family-run business purchasing collections for over 50 years. From single items to lifetime collections. No collection is too small or too big. Buy, sell or exchange. Any age or any gauge. Rails will take everything locos, coaches, wagons, track work, controllers, accessories. In fact, they will take absolutely everything and certainly will not cherry pick the best items. Rails are only a phone call away. Call them now for the very best price and get instant cash payment or same day transfer. Check them out today at the link below. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYM Arish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 Class, Ian Coulson, Alan Dickerson, Eddie Papere, 
Karen Nicholl, Medwin Williams, Crossways Point Junction, 3B Rail, and Jennifer Horton. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.